Good evening. Famine, prisons, your right to privacy, and scotch on the rocks. But here's Ted with the detail of the rundown. The toughest critic of the current prison and parole system is former provincial judge Les Bewley. What does he think about the recent proposals of the Canadian Sentencing Commission? Webster gets the answer later with Les Bewley. What does the government know about you that you haven't told your closest friends? And if the government knows, who else has access to that information? Tonight, Webster talks with John Grace, Canada's first privacy commissioner. The World Curling Championship starts this Monday under the dome at BC Place. Tonight, Webster comes to you out of the hack in a curling slideabout. But first, will the human race destroy our planet in the name of progress? On the fate of Mother Earth, Webster speaks with Maurice Strong, special advisor on the environment to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Maurice Strong, a famous Canadian, is a man of many parts. He's here partly as a former senior official of the United Nations, and he is now the Canadian member of the World Commission on Environmental Environment and Development. That's right. Now, you spent a long time in the Sahara when we were being fed all these stories about the fantastic African famines. Mm -hmm. Have they been cured? The immediate famine has been cured in the sense that the rains have come and people are now eating. The fundamental causes of the famine will take a long time to cure. Listen, with the population of the world, including Africa, exploding all the time, can they ever be cured? They certainly can, and there are lots of very positive stories, examples of where they have been cured. But we cannot underestimate the problems of Africa. Africa, in some ways, is an underpopulated con continent. But in the areas in which they get very low rainfall, and before the last famine, they had 17 years of below average rainfall, that would be a problem anywhere. But in a, pro in a country like that, where they have you know, grinding poverty and they've started right at the, at, the, at the bottom of the economic ladder, of course, it was, you know, this, this turned into a, 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 a famine. And we'll have future famines if we don't address the fundamental causes. Well, is, it, is that called, caused by climate or by the environment, by pollution? Essentially, it's not by pollution as such, but it is an environmental uh, breakdown in the sense that the productive land, the product agricultural systems and the forest and the water systems, which they all depend on for their livelihood, have broken down. Broken down, one, because of increase in population, yes, but in the escalation of human activity. As, uh, oh, uh, now, I don't know if you're queued in to the South Mosby National Park, are you? But would you recommend that we cut down not another tree in Canada so that we can preserve the environment rather than create jobs? No, I would say... Spiritually speaking. I would, I would say this, that there are places in Canada like South Moresby uh, which are, are unique by world standards that should be preserved. And we, and, but I'm saying that that will, in the final analysis, create jobs that we don't have to cut down every tree in Canada in order to preserve you some You sound of just like a guest I had on last night called David Suzuki. I see. Well, I'm all with, for David Suzuki. With whom I have a fairly violent disagreement. I've got this kind of predilection for jobs for people in Canada. Is that nasty? Yeah, well, let me you know, but, it, but, uh, but it's misguided if you think there is a basic conflict between protection of the environment and economic growth. One of the things that this World Commission has done is we, 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 we've read, looked at the evidence and, and we'll release our report on April 27th, but I can tell you one of the main themes of that report is that if we want a new era of economic growth in this world and in this country, we have got to marry economic development with environmental protection, which well, is... What can you do, the United Nations, which is fairly powerless in many fields, about raising the forests of the Amazon basin? Well, the only, only the Brazilians and the other people in that basin can do it. But let me tell you, when I first went there as head of the United Nations Environment Program, uh, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now, uh, they, Brazilians were a damn it. They were not going to hear of any UN or any international interference in their affairs. However, 
after a lot of pressure, and the media helps, people like you, oh. they, 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 they have moved. There is a now an awareness that the destruction of their tropical forests is destroying an economic asset for them, as well as an asset that is important for the whole maintenance of the life systems of this planet. I suppose if a disaster is going to come to the world uh, from environment, it will come from the ozone layer, or something like that? That's one of several things. I mean, what we're really right now recognizing, Jack, is that this this uh, this economic growth that we love, that we all want, I enjoy it too, mm -hmm. and we want to continue, has produced some byproducts, and some of those byproducts are threatening our very survival. And the depletion of the ozone layer is one of them. The the increase in the carbon dioxide content, which is the filter that determines the temperature on you know on on Earth, the temperature balance. These things are being radically altered by our own human activities, and we've got to bring those activities under some kind of management. But in the terms of uh, the lifespan of Earth, yes. what little pollution we do doesn't make a damn difference to the universe. Does it, it does. It does. The universe. To the well, if we think our universe is the Earth, and mm -hmm. we can look out into the cosmos, and we don't see, we see a lot of fantastic things happening, stars, you know, exploding, etc. But we don't see any sign that there's anywhere else in the universe where there is a human form of life. There may be. You can, mm. Mathematically, you can postulate that. But this life on Earth is a very precious thing, and it's, it would be a cosmic event if it were to disappear. If you were an environmental czar of the planet Earth, you would stop the use of fossil fuels? No, I wouldn't. I would develop a gradual uh, transition. We've made these transitions before in history. Fossil fuels aren't going to last forever anyway. Uh, what we need is an energy mix that we can live with. Mm -hmm. That will, uh, and that's perfectly achievable. You know, it's easy to be pessimistic mm -hmm. because the evidence looks so mind-boggling. But you know, when you actually, when you look at our history, we've got lots of evidence that when things had to happen. Somehow we developed the will to make it happen. In other words, the only major uh, catastrophe the world faces really is Chernobyl in spades. Well, Chernobyl is an example, and Bhopal is an example of what happens. Bhopal, oh, that's Bhopal uh, in India, the you know the the, the chemical plant that uh, that uh, uh, got loose uh, on got us, got loose and uh, and uh, killed so many people. But these are just you know these are are, are dramatic manifestations of a much more general phenomena, which is that human beings have grown in their numbers on this planet from 1.6 billion at the beginning of the century to 5 billion now, and in 13 years at the end of the century, it'll be 6 billion people. But the, they have also escalated their activities in terms mm. of pursuit of economic growth. Yeah. And we're now, in effect, we're the ones who are determining our own future, and we've got to manage that future if we want to survive. We can't even manage locally. Here is Ontario refusing to pay extra for low sulfur coal from BC, bringing in the high sulfur stuff from the states because it's cheaper, yeah, yeah. and creating more acid rain. Oh, that's right. We've got lots of sins, and lots of, you know, we're a long way from what we've got to be. But when you take a look at how far we've gone in this century, you can be pretty hopeful, too. One final question. We are now fairly pollution conscious in Canada. Yes, despite the troubles across the border and acid rain. I presume we're among the cleaner nations on the earth. We're one of the luckier ones. We've got more environment per person than almost anyone. That's a heavy responsibility. But why don't we do like the Japanese? Instead of resisting these things, why don't we turn it into an economic advantage? The Japanese, who were one of the most polluted countries, ha are now way out ahead in pollution technology. Pollution control, environmental cr control, is creating more jobs, more profit, for Japanese companies because they recognized that they had to move with the times. We've got to do that too. Environmental protection is simply just protecting our asset base, protecting the, the resources on which we depend for our livelihood. Modest, modest, strong. I'm grateful for you coming in today and we shall watch for your report from the World Commission on Environment and Development. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. My thanks, Modest Strong. Next, the Privacy Commissioner, after the break. <laughs> Canada has, and many of us don't know it, a Privacy Act. And with me is John Grace, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Now, privacy. Uh, privacy for whom? I saw the other day a whole bunch of 16 million files were stolen from the Canada and it, from somewhere, and anybody could get an SIN number, phone up Revenue Canada and get all the information. How could that happen? That's a privacy disaster, Jack. That was a privacy Chernobyl, really. Mm -hmm. Terrible. I don't think that it's... It, Fortunately, I don't think there was much damage done because really an individual couldn't call up 
Revenue Canada and get information casually off the telephone. They're, 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 they're smart about that. They're that not claim it away. was made. That, that claim was made, time was out of call. but it was not true. Now, what does the Privacy Act give to me? First of all, it gives you a right to have access to your own personal information held by the federal government, one of a, any of one of 140 institutions or more. It covers only federal government personal information, not the provinces, not the, not the private sector. And it also gives you, Jack, the right to expect that your information will be used only for the purpose for which you gave it, with your consent. And, s and thirdly, it gives you the right to expect that uh, the government will only collect information that it needs to have to conduct a particular program. Give me an example. For instance, my medical records would be, would be provincial, wouldn't they? Yes, they would be, or, or yes, with the health service here, I suppose. All right, give me an example of the kind of thing they might have, for instance, on me. The federal government? Yeah. Well, I take it you're an immigrant in this country. Right. When you, when you came to this country, uh, quite a bit of personal information was collected about you. That's uh, in, in, a, in a file somewhere in immigration. Uh, you pay uh, you know, the pension plan, all your, your, you know, your earnings and whatever. Income tax. Income tax, whatever you can. If you've ever applied for a grant, I doubt you've ever applied for a grant. But, uh, not yet. Not yet. Soon. You, you, soon, okay. <laughs> but uh, they, they would have uh, that. If you apply for a student loan, I, I'm sure fishermen, uh, wheat farmers, they give a lot of personal information. All right. If I'm refused a student loan, or if okay. I'm refused something I'm applying for, can I come to you and say, I suspect that they're using information inaccurately about me, which is wrongly in the yeah. data bank? Yeah. The first thing you do, you apply to get the information they have, uh, the right you have to get it. You apply to the student loan people and to see if the information they have is correct. If they won't give it to you, if they won't give you that information, they only give you part of it, then you apply to me. I'm a kind of a specialized ombudsman, a privacy ombudsman. So I'll go to bat for you. I, I will see the file. I have a great job, you know, I can see any file in the country dealing with personal information. Oh, you have the powers of a judge? The powers of a judge to subpoena witnesses, to, uh, to, to help hold a hearing, but I can't enforce orders. I can say, I think that information should go to Jack Webster, but if they say, no, no, Grace, you're wrong, we think uh, we should keep it, then we go to federal court. Supposing I'm a federal inmate and in an institution yeah. and I feel my parole has been wrongly handled, can I come to you for the information on that parole to see if I was unfairly treated? I don't have the information. You go to the, per, you yeah. go to the, the, the penitentiary service. They have your information. They give it to you. I get involved only if you don't get what you think you're entitled to get. But I can get that information. You can get that information by matter of right. All right. Supposing the RCMP have done an investigation on me without proper cause, and I want to see my, the reports of their investigation on me, which may have resulted in a warrant but no charge. Mm -hmm. Can I go to the RCMP and say, I want to see the basis of this investigation? That's a tough question. You can certainly go. Whether you'll get all you uh, expect to receive is, uh, is, is up for discussion. Uh, police have a right to protect informants. If there is no charge, conceivably no damage was done. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could feel, if you felt that the police were holding information back that you, were, that you should have, you'll complain to me. I'll examine it. No charge. Absolutely no charge to apply for your information. No charge for an but investigation, an independent investigation by an officer of parliament, which I am. But you'll look at that and say, well, the Mounties are right. They can't give that information. I might very well. I, I work under a privacy act. I don't manufacture privacy rights. But uh, the act says, in principle, you, you, you should have it. And I'll go to bat for you. Now, um, how many people use this service, though? Well, Say, 1983, the act came in. Well, yes, uh, and in the first three years, more than 100,000 Canadians have applied to receive their own personal information under the act, which I think is surprising in number, Jack. In which kind of areas would the bulk of inquiries be? People about whom ad important administrative decisions are made, they're the people who use the act, inmates. Persons cut off from unemployment insurance. They think, a mistake has been made. I want to see the whole file. The dates are messed up, perhaps. Public servants use the act. Public servants in Ottawa use it. They know it. Uh, for the first time, the d uh, defense people, the uh, uh, national defense uh, soldiers, army people, have a right to have access to their personnel files. They didn't before. And there's a big, large number of people wanting to see those files. There's a lot of democracy nowadays in the there's army. A lot of perhaps. democracy. Yeah. Listen, in your report, though, yeah. you paint a rather fearsome picture about the impossibility of maintaining privacy with the new microcomputers and the kind of eavesdropping and optical systems and mm -hmm. electronic tracking pages. Is that within your act? If, if I find somebody doing that to me, can I come to you? Microcomputers are in my, in my domain. I worry about the proliferation of microcomputers. 
everybody, as long as the computers were big, it was fairly easy to, to control who was having access there, despite the hackers. I think the ha hackers were overblown. But if, if a microcomputer is sitting on an awful lot of people's desks in government, these people are collecting uh, vast amounts of information, information that would take many uh. filing cabinets to hold. They're, in, they're networking, and I think it's, very, it's much more difficult now with the microcomputer to impose some kind of decent privacy standards. Another thing that I've had uh, complained about is the fact that much Canadian data is kept in computers in the United States. Does that come in with, within your purview? No, it doesn't. Uh, there's uh, some law that, uh, but not the, uh, not the Privacy Act. The, the law says, for example, the banks m must maintain, if they maintain information in the United States, they must maintain duplicate information in Canada. No information outside the country does not come under my purview. So we're doing not too badly on privacy. I think we're doing pretty well. There's nothing to be complacent about, though, Jack. Nothing to be complacent about. Uh, the, uh, the social insurance number is a uh, That is was a one of the great issue. fears, the great. SIN number. But that SIN number, surely a government official can take my SIN number and read through the computers everything that's known about me. No. Well? No. <coughs> the well, principle, f a privacy principle is that information collected by one department shall be only used by that one department. Now, obviously, Revenue Canada could plug in to its holdings about you, and, and, and that's, that's fine. But Revenue Canada will not uh, allow another department in government <coughs> to plug into its, its, its computers about not you. Not even the RCMP. Okay, under with re good grounds, <laughs> and they leave a, they leave a uh, uh, trail, and I, 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 I'm involved in this thing too. Yeah, I can see that would be reasonable. If you're going to catch some big the mafia con man, <laughs> and you want to see yeah. the source of his uh, washed laundry money, See, privacy has to give way to other values, to justice. I'm, I'm, I'm not a wide-eyed privacy nut, I hope. Mm -hmm. I, the privacy is important. I fight for it. I'm paid to. But gives way to, uh, to, to, to national defense. John, John Gray is Canada's privacy commissioner pr because you're federal. I'm federal only. Your questions to John Gray is after the break. Questions to John Grace, Canada's Privacy Commissioner. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, that's you. Where are you? Go ahead, please. Hey, well, I was wondering what jurisdiction do you have to compel the CSIS to release their files on political dissenters? For example, Med Broadband, I believe, never did get his file that was compiled by the RCMP. Well, I, I, I go by the Privacy Act, and uh, clearly there are some exceptions to... Uh, to uh, receiving personal information, information that is deemed to be uh, against the public interest to reveal, that information will not go out. And uh, I, I cannot manufacture public uh, privacy rights. Uh, I'll see the file and make a judgment as to whether or not the agency that held back that information was right in, uh, in holding it back. And, and uh, you can even do that with the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. I sure can. It comes under the Privacy Act. Yeah. It does. But obviously, if it's national security, it's kind of difficult to... They won't put it out. And, of course, if, there, if there's disagreement, the individual can go to the federal court, and the court can make a decision. Supposing there was a political file on somebody which contained only newspaper clippings, mm -hmm. would you release that? I don't release it. The, uh, the agency may or may not. I might recommend they release it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But they would have the last say on that. They have the last say. You can only go public on on your complaints about non-release? Yeah, I, well, I don't even go public unless the complainant wants to go public. I'm, I'm, I, c I report in private to the complainant. Now, if he wants to go public, that's up to him or to her. Go ahead, please. Jack, we're going to miss you when you retire. Thank you. And I was wondering if there is a provincial commissioner. Do I'd like to get access to some provincial records, and I've been told, bugger off. <gasps> oh, that's the way they talk in B.C.? Really? Um, there is no uh, Provincial Privacy Act in British Columbia. There is one in Quebec, one coming in Ontario, one coming in Manitoba, none in B.C. You might go to the Ombudsman and try him for size. He's as useless as a bump on a log. <laughs> I've Th already tried him. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Yes. I'm from Vancouver. Yeah. And um, the adoption agency, I guess it's the social services. Um, we have a people have a hard time finding their, their natural parents or their natural brothers. A lot of countries in the world, you're allowed to, to 
see the file. Sets the records. Now, let's see if John Grace has anything to do with that at all. I don't. Uh, that's a provincial matter. And uh, if it were covered under the uh, uh, federal act, if they had some information about it, we could. But basically, no, because it's a private uh, provincial Vital matter. Vital statistics and provincial matters. Provincial matters. Yeah, yeah, they're talking about allowing adults to join together in registries here, but it's not the full wide open system. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, what I'd like to know is if a credit agency uh, or uh, somebody like a bank or something like that or uh, somebody who lends money uh, say that you owed some money would have access to a income tax return if you had a refund coming back, would they be able to get that information and uh, attach it or whatever? The answer is no. They, sh they certainly should not be able to. So they can't get into the income tax file returns? Revenue Canada is very good about that. No. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. I'd like to ask your guest, Jack. If I have had one husband that was killed overseas, World War II, and my second husband uh, died, and he was also in over in H L L Holland, trying to say London and Holland at the same time. And I'm wanting to ask Mr. Grace uh, if a widow can obtain the records of her uh, service men husband. Uh, you know, and w what the address would be for any information. Okay. The principle is that uh, a person's private information, personal information, is held personal and private for 20 years after death. That's the general principle. However, if it can be shown in, 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 in a special circumstance that the information should be put out, I think you have a case to make. I try to make the case. I can't give you the address, but call Veterans Affairs. Veterans Affairs in Ottawa. In Ottawa. Go ahead from Vernon. Yeah. Hi, Jack. I'm sorry you're retiring, but uh, how do you obtain uh, Armed Forces uh, records? You go to Veterans Affairs. The individual applies to Veterans Affairs for his or her own records. And, and they will give them out? They have to give it out in 30 days, or that constitutes a delay and a reason to complain to me. You have to p fill out a little application form that you'll find in public uh, libraries, in government, federal government offices, uh, do a little bit of uh, detective work. You decide on what information bank that information is most likely to be contained. Uh, each bank has a separate number. Flip through that book. It's the size of a Vancouver telephone book. And, uh, and apply uh, to the address that uh, is indicated. No charge. Tell me, the 2200 Federal Information Bank. Yeah, 20. And I can go to the public library. Yes. Uh, don't I go to the department itself? You could, but there's no need to go to uh, the particular department. The library has the, uh, the something called the Personal Information Index. Uh, you get it there or you get it in any, in any federal government department. And you must get your information in 30 days or you want to know the reason why? If, if the department can, can ask for one 30-day delay if it's really, they're having really a problem, but they have to give reason. But 30 days is the rule. Very good. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, Mr. Grace. Yes. Uh, last year I corresponded with the Soviet Embassy and I asked for a free, free subscription to the Soviet News and Views, which I receive each month in a brown envelope. And I've noticed a couple times that the envelope has been tampered with before I, I open it. It's been already been opened. So I'm wondering if perhaps I'm, an, I'm an on, on a RCMP list or something like that. I'd like to know how to access that information. Well, if you want to access uh, your files in the RCMP or the security service, the civilian security service, uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, you may get some of it, you may, you may not. Uh, but go to that book that I spoke of, go to the uh, Personal Information Index and look under RCMP and, uh, and uh, apply. So uh, in your view, do you think there is a possibility that I am, I am on a list of some sort? Sir, I have no idea whether you are or not. Okay, thank you. I thought we'd stop that caper years ago. Go ahead, please. Hi. I have another question about the RCMP. I was wondering, can we get files on RCMP investigations? Probably not. Probably not. Um, the, uh, the, the Act says that uh, uh, ongoing active police investigations uh, are, are really grounds for exemption for giving out information. The, you know, the, the uh, prosecution of crime uh, comes before privacy sometimes. Right. Yeah. And um, can, can you enlighten me as to what is uh, Data Bank P138? No, I'm afraid I don't know those 2,200 data banks by heart. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Last call. Go ahead, please. Jack. Yes. Um, I got a small mail order catalog from J. Norris Canada Incorporated, and it says, Happy Birthday. No need to wait for next January 12th because we have a surprise birthday gifts for you. How do they know it's my birthday January 12th? Because 
somebody has given your information out, and, you, and that's, that's wrong. That violates good privacy protection and good privacy principles. You gave information for one purpose, and that information was given to somebody else for another purpose. That's prohibited under the Privacy Act. But, but it's, only, it's only an offense if it comes from a federal government source. Exactly. If it comes from a private flak mailing list, you're dead in the water. It's, it's a still a free country. Thank you, ma'am. Most annoying. John Grace, you've been a mine of information tonight. Thank you, Jack. It's been best my pleasure. Luck, and best, best of luck to you, sir. Come to Ottawa and be the next privacy commissioner. <laughs> Thanks, John. Much obliged. Go hold it. Okay. After the break, Les Bueller. <laughs> The Canadian Sentencing Commission has come down with some recommendations, which I think it can be safely said vindicate the views of one Les Bewley, former Provincial Court judge, who has been assailed for many years now for what uh, certain groups regard as his reactionary views on crime punishment and parole. Do you feel vindicated by the recommendations of the Sentencing Commission, Leslie? I guess so. I'm not used to being vindicated for anything, but, and if this is vindication, I'll have to get used to it. How bad has the system been up to now? And I'm talking about parole, mandatory release, supervision, and the rest of it. And sentencing, what, happened, what has been happening to the sentencing by judges? How bad has it been? There are no words in the vocabulary to describe its depravity and its failure. It's been obscene, it's been horrible, it's been disgraceful, and it's been disgusting. You want some more? Yes, please. Uh, appalling. Okay, but on the specifics, I remember you saying many times and writing many, many years ago that judges had lost control of sentencing, correct? Correct. And what did... I also said that, that a judge's sentence ain't worth warm spit anymore. You were on the bench at the time. No. I was off the bench at that time. I, I read it in my book. Yeah, this was the book. This, this is a very good little book indeed. This is where you had a cartoon framed in your judge's chambers. An earnest, an earnest young woman being tied across the railroad tracks before an oncoming train by a, a villain. The young woman, clearly the possessor of a postgraduate degree in criminology, sociology, or anthropology, is saying to him, I don't hate you, Gerald, you're sick, and I feel sorry for you. <laughs> Very good deed. Now, let's look at the recommendations of the Canadian Sentencing Commission. Scrap the present parole system. Right. What do you think of that? Good. Bang on. What do you think about the fact that there the should be maximum sentences laid down in the criminal code for certain punishments, including a maximum in most cases of 12 years? Again, again, pretty well bang on. I, I think there are some cases where it should be more than 12 for repeat offenders, but bang on still. And what do you think of the provision that uh, involving heinous crimes, a judge should be able to increase a prison term by 50% above the statutory maximum? Not sure about that, Jack. I haven't had a chance to read the report in extenso. Is that a good word, extenso? In extenso is a good word. All right. And uh, But you believe that uh, this business, if they... Oh, yes, the other point in it is that uh, prisoners shall be released after serving three quarters of their sentence. Is that an improvement? Yes, oh, definitely. Tell me how bad it was and uh, how bad it is today, then, really. Well, it's, it's almost inexpressible, Jack. Uh, let me go back a few years. I, I remember sitting in the chambers of the late Chief Justice J.O. Wilson, one of the greatest judges we ever had in Canada. You remember him well. Well. Mm -hmm. He convicted the Minister of Lands and Forests, Mr. Summers, you remember. And uh, J. O. Wilson had greater trial experience than any judge in the Commonwealth. Now, I remember sitting in his chambers one day, and the youngest member of the National Parole Board came in to see the Chief Justice where he had been summoned to come, because all the judges were mad as hell about what the Parole Board were doing to their sentences. So he summons the Chief Justice's chambers. I was there. The young member, the youngest member of the parole board said, Chief Justice, we are the experts on sentencing. Mm -hmm. To a judge who had more experience in sentencing than, you know, anybody in, in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And this man had sentenced nobody in his life. Mm -hmm. The Chief Justice listened to this and he turned and he looked out over Howe Street in the swivel chair and he listened for a moment. And then the young member of the parole board said, and after all, Chief Justice, 
We are the experts in sentencing, and we have the law on our side, to which the Chief Justice replied with absolute disgust on his face, I know you have the law, meaning the parole act on your side, young man. It's just the goddamn way you exercise it that concerns us, you know. Because up until this very moment, uh, even the dangerous offender is liable for, is eligible for parole something like uh, three years after he, is, after he goes to jail. Right, and any serious offender now is eligible at the moment for day parole and one-sixth of his sentence, you know. Mm -hmm. and one-third for full parole. But the point must be made to you that no matter what sentence the judge gives, in the past, if a judge gave a sentence of six years, a guy would be out in two, right? Oh, sure, very often. A sentence of 15 years, a guy would be out in five, right? Yes, and often before that on day parole. And day parole wasn't just for one day. That could go on for weeks or months, you see. Yeah, and unescorted temporary absence, too. Would you stop all those things? Sure, every one of them. All of them? Sure. Uh, look, I think it's absolutely absurd when you have unescorted temporary absences or even escorted ones when prisoners are going out to watch the ballet or to take part in bridge tournaments, for goodness sake, you know, or some other highly cultural event. But, but uh, does that not make you a little bit archaic? I mean, surely selected prisoners, surely too many people are in jail for nonviolent crimes who should be out a lot sooner. No, I don't agree with that. You think a, a non-violent crime deserves as much of a penalty as a violent crime? Very often. Do you remember uh, a lawyer called Duncan Crux in this town? Still around. Who set up a Commonwealth Trust company? Mm -hmm. Bit of a... Well, he did his time, came he, out again. He did his time, but you see, as a result of the defalcations which occurred through the Commonwealth Trust, a lot of elderly people lost everything they had, including their homes. There are three people who committed suicide, three elderly people, as a result of this nonviolent So you reckon crime. that kind of heavy commercial crime should have the same kind of penalties as the... You're darn right. If some older person loses everything, his whole life savings in his home as a result of that, I'd treat him like a bank robber any day in the week. You're not for community sentencing? No, not as a rule. Now, what about capital punishment? No, I'm all for it. All for it? Uh, only 110 percent, that's all. Uh, yeah, but not for all murder. No, not for all murder. Just for those which are pretty generally agreed upon now, premeditated murder. Providing a man is, uh, providing the, the criminal is not insane? Yes. Oh, sure. That's part of it. Premeditated murder, contract murder, murders of police officers? Right. Prison guards? Right. All the way? Yes. Do you think the Tory government is going to win the battle for you? No, they haven't got the guts. They'll probably stall it off. Because the Prime Minister, uh, going the way he's going, and disappointing as he is, he probably stole it off, and and then the, the Senate, the Liberal appointed Senate, will stall it even further and try to pitch the whole thing into the next election. All the forces opposed to capital punishment are doing their best to stall it. They won't meet it with honest debate. Even their arguments are phony, Jack. Completely phony. You know, the, the latest, the biggest argument they have is, why kill people who kill people in order to show that killing is wrong. It's a Christian argument. Oh, you're crazy, my, my goodness. You got a Bible here? No. No, well, I'll show you as many arguments saying that, you know, that death an is eye a for an eye, a tooth, tooth for a tooth. Sure. So okay. let's not get into the Christianity. But I gather you're generally pleased with the possibility that the Sentencing Commission will put the powers of sentencing back in the hands of the judge without the present sloppy parole. Sure I am. But I'm not at all hopeful at the moment that the present government and the members of parliament will buy this. Uh, right now, according to the Globe and Mail this morning, there's tremendous objection to the Sentencing Commission's proposals. The, the uh, parole board spokesman and the correctional board spokesman, all of whom want to defend their, their luscious little empires and are not going to give them up in a hurry, believe me, they don't want to give up this empire building they're going through here, are all opposing it and saying it's silly. Well, it isn't. Uh, Les Bewley and your questions to him after the break. I'm sorry you don't have any faith that the government would implement the new Sentencing Commission's report. Well, not much faith at the moment. My hope remains unimpaired, but you see, my experience has been, Jack, that most politicians and governments 
listens to the academics, they listen to professors of criminology mm -hmm. and sociology, and they're so brainwashed by these academics that they don't know a real fact of life when they see one anymore. You know. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Jack. Good Your afternoon. Honor. Right. Uh, one of the things that um, I've been involved in corrections for a lot of years, one of the inconsistency in sentences that I've found is that you have so vast a disparity in terms of the same circumstances involving the uh, crime and the, uh, the individual is uh, found guilty, and yet you could have two months for the uh, sentence, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years less a day, or two years. And it goes from a very vast and wide spectrum. While I agree with the judge's uh, uh, situation in that we're vastly too soft in many cases, mm -hmm. but I think there is a lot of latitude for closing the gap up in relation to sentencing. In other words, the disparity and the vast range of opportunity that the judges have to sentence should be closed up. And what do you think of that? And you made your point. What do you think? He's bang on. Uh, it isn't clear from the sentencing submission report as much as we've seen of it when they talk about uh, maximum sentence. Maximum sentences and a classification of sentences. But what I hope it means, and what is starting in the United States now, is that in a certain category of crime for, say, a second offender, you get X years with no parole. If you are stupid enough to come out of prison and repeat that crime, you get X plus Y years and no parole. But it's flat across the board with a variation 10% above or 10% below. But if we were sitting as two judges and we have a common assault case, I might give the guy three months and you might give him two years. Sure. You might have been just out of a law school and been trained by a criminologist or something who believes that nobody should go to jail. On the other hand, I might have seen a few crooks myself and seen a few dead bodies, and I'll say, well, yes, somebody should. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Go ahead, please. Yeah, it's just, Bewley, I'm interested in uh, what you think about economic crimes, people that uh, send out bum checks and the like. He just told us he thinks the punishment should be as heavy as a physical crime. Well, it almost sounds to me like Judge Bewley waxes poetic for the good old days of trial by ordeal, for God's sake, on some of these things. No, that's not trial by ordeal. It's trial by judge, or judge and jury. That's not trial by ordeal, where you have two people going at each other with maces and clubs. Come back with it. Listen, I'm someone who, You think who, someone who signs over a bum check for $500 should do 14 years? That's what the maximum is on some of these things. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. Where'd you get that idea from? Totally ludicrous. Well, that's your idea. It isn't mine or it isn't well, I, Just by listening to you, the tone of your uh, conversation, I, I, it's almost like you're in agreement with some of these things. Well, stop listening to the tone and listen to the words for a change. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Jack, I think you've met your equal in, in uh, dealing with people sitting across the desk. Uh, sir, do you think you could tone down your, your right-wing form of justice uh, for the simple fact that I think you're a valuable person, and if you did tone it down a little bit, you might get back on the bench whether you want to or not, and we'd have another good man back on, back on the bench. Is there any point in, in backing off a little bit in order to... Uh, create some good and quit smirking, Jack. I'm not smirking. <laughs> you may be retiring, but you're still smirking. I think he was smirking. <laughs> I think he was. Guilty of smirking. Six Guilty months of what's your 25 answer, likes. Judge. Well, I think you're probably right. If I was a nicer, sweeter, more accommodating sort of a guy, uh, a little more but not, not nicer or sweeter, just, just slightly less uh, verbose uh, uh, and, and carrying on your work without uh, uh, angering the bleeding heart liberal. Okay. Euphemistic, perhaps. I'm sorry? Euphemistic, perhaps? You got him there. <laughs> you, I should use euphemism. I, mean, I couldn't understand. Uh, okay. Well, you know, I could okay. use... I Good could luck to both of you, and uh, both of you go back to work. Thank you very much. Okay. Go ahead from Yellowknife. Okay, I'd like to know basically what the judge's opinion is of manufactured evidence. I know from my own experience that the police are uh, tempted sometimes to exaggerate in court, and there have been lots of mistakes made in terms of people being wrongfully imprisoned. Now, if a person's wrongfully killed, there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And this is the only reservation I have about capital punishment. How does the, uh, how does the judge answer that? I answer it two ways. That any policeman who manufactures or concocts evidence should go to jail himself. 
and I'm not even sure that he should be in protective custody either. That's the worst thing a policeman can do. I know some of them try it, and I suspect some of them may have gotten away with it, but it's still a crime, and I would deal with that severely. Now, as far as wrongfully convicting people, and, and you know, I get so sick, Jack, of hearing about the case of Donald Marshall, the Nova Scotia Indian boy who served 11 years on a charge of murder, which was later found he did not commit. What people don't understand or never have bothered to find out is that Donald Marshall was engaged with another boy in an armed robbery at the time. They were mugging a couple of older fellows in a park. Well, he served 11 years, and he could have served 11 years for the armed robbery alone, but he was charged with murder. He was not, con not con sentenced on first-degree murder. He was never really in any danger of hanging if we had hanging. He was second-degree murder, was second he not? Yes. He so was you say he deserved to do the 11 years anyway? Well, sure. It was a case of armed robbery. So he, he, I get so tired of people saying, poor Donald Marsher, the poor fella. Well, he was engaged in armed robbery, and he had a little record before that. So, And not only that, but Donald Marshall, trying to conceal the fact he was engaged in armed robbery during his murder trial, lied in his teeth all the way through his testimony. He convicted himself through his lies before the jury. Now, if somebody wants to convict themselves through their lies, I haven't got much sympathy for them. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. Uh, Judge Bewley, I've heard some of your vitriolic uh, remarks about a person you're sentencing. I think the first thing I read was you said a woman uh, deserved to be in a garbage can. And I'm in corrections. I have never seen any justice. And uh, I just wonder if you have any regrets or any apologies for some of the things that you have said at sentencing and what you have said in print in the sun. Well, nothing I can uh, think of regretting in the sun. Well, maybe one or two columns. Sure, I have lots of regret uh, going back over my 70 years. There are lots of things I'd do differently. I'd be sweeter and kinder and more euphemistic, I suppose. But uh, on the whole, I haven't got many regrets. And I'm sorry you feel I'm vitriolic. Uh, uh, I guess the more sensitive people are, the more they think it's vitriol. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Judge Bewley, I just wanted you to know that uh, I think in uh, 72, 73, you sentenced me very lightly, uh, where it was well within your purview to sentence me heavily. Um, I went on from there. Uh, I've never committed another criminal act since then. I have a family. I'm doing well now, and I'm employed. And uh, you were speaking earlier of your heavier sentences. I just want to remind you of a one time where you gave me a bit of a break, and it worked out very well. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I think I can say without fear of contradiction, while a former Judge Bewley has attracted a lot of attention for his outspoken comments, he was regarded as a good judge on the bench. When you can take that compliment and like it or lump it. I'll take it. My thanks to you, Les, old friend, and I shall be back after the break. I'm in the BC Stadium, which has been transformed into an ice arena for the World Cuddling Championships, the Men's World Cuddling Championships. And I have a disgraceful admission to make as a Scotchman. I have never thrown a rock in my life. However, I've decided to take part in this tournament, may well be on the winning team, which is the Scotch team. Your name, sir? Uh, Grant McPherson. Grant McPherson. Which position are you in the team? Uh, skip. You're the skip? Yeah. That means you're the boss, right? Well, they don't see it that way. <laughs> I know your face. What are you doing here? Uh, I'm here as fifth man for Scotland. And what's your name? Billy Andrew. Billy Andrew. But where did I see your face last week? Uh, in Victoria. What were you doing there? Uh, World Junior Finals. Did you win that one? I did, aye. Well, you did better than the senior team did <laughs> a, a year ago, didn't you? We did, aye. We didn't win better. Now, this is my friend here. Hammy McMillan. Hammy. Hammy. You know, I like to talk to you folk because it makes my accent sound so Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from, Hammy? Stranra. Stranra. I see. And the Glasgow man. We'll go straight to Glasgow man. Richard? Richard Harding. Richard Harding. How long have you been curling? Oh, about 15 years. I understand from uh, some of your friends that uh, you aped your mother's lawn bowling and became a good curler. Is that correct? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's Roy. Roy, 
You are the coach. I'm the coach, I'm afraid to say, yes. And your last name? Sinclair. Roy Sinclair, and you're from Perth? I'm indeed, yeah. Uh huh. And do you think that we, the Scotch team, will do any better this year than we did last year? Well, we can't go that much better, but we'll, we'll surely go the whole way, eh? Is it right that you Scotch uh, cuddlers have changed your techniques in recent years? Yeah, but it's all the Canadians' fault, Jack. Why is it the Canadians' fault? <laughs> well, they teach us the striking game, and now they, they try to draw like we used to do, and we've had the same results, I think. The draw is like the lawn bowling draw, That's isn't it? That's it, yeah, indeed. Right? Yep. So you're now, now doing the brutal Canadian game? Yeah, we, it took us a while to learn, Jack. We've picked it up, we're not bad at it now. Uh -huh. Now, what was the score last year when Canada beat you? 4-3. 4-3, it's the man in the back row. Yeah. 4-3. How yeah. long have you been curling? Uh, I took it up late in life. I was 40 when I started, and I'm not going to tell you how long I've been curling. Oh, no, no, I would say 20, 25 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, 30 years now. <laughs> if I'm going to be the spare on the team, yeah. you've got to show me how to... Okay. How to what? Throw? Yeah, deliver a stone. Yeah. Deliver a stone? Yeah, throw a rock, as you would say. I said throw a rock. Is yeah. that the Canadian way? Yeah. It's deliver a stone? Absolutely. You've been here too long, Jack. Is, uh, did the stone, do all the stones come from Ailsa Craig? They used to, but not now anymore. <clears throat> we got a few Welsh stones up there, would you believe? Welsh? Yeah, Welsh granite. Welsh granite stones. Yeah. All right, we'll now adjourn for a second, and you will show me how to... Although this this isn't pebbled yet, this new ice. Yeah, that's right. So that means what? It means it's got to be very slow, and you'll have to take a run at it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Would you do one first? Uh, no, you can't. I'm not allowed. You're not allowed to. No. But you can. Well, that would be kind of taking an edge, wouldn't it? Well, getting a feel for things. <laughs> getting a feel for things. Well, you can demonstrate without a rock for me, and then I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Come on, Roy. My moment of glory. <laughs> Now, here's my rock, yes. my stone. Yep. What's the technique I do? Where do right. I put my foot? You put your right foot just on the hack there. In the cramp it. In the, because it's what it was in our day, Jack, yeah. And your right, right hand on the stone there like that, and you slide her back, straight arm, and away you go. Right now, and do I also slide forward with my left foot? No. no. That could be serious in that our case. That could be case, serious. Yeah. Okay. Do I that turn the handle? Yeah, you turn the handle clockwise. Yeah. That's it. That'll do. <laughs> okay. Come on in, Barry. <laughs> Barry well Neymar, done. what's your title? In, you're a former world cuddler yourself, aren't you? I am, that's right, Jack. But you're too fat for it now. I guess so. A number of your team, the Canadian team, were told to lose weight, weren't they? That's true. In order to qualify for the Olympic trials, the, the Canadian Curling Association and Curl Canada came out with a edict that the boys must trim down. And they trimmed down? Yes, they did. But you don't have to? I don't have to, no. Okay, Barry, uh, what days is the event on? It's on from uh, April, March 30th to April 5th. Their first draw is Monday at noon, opening draw. Ten teams? Ten teams. All around the world? All around the world. And who knows, Canada might win. They've got casinos upstairs, too. A little bit of social credit type gambling within the law. Monday, we're going to speak to Brian Smith about the electronic control of uh, prisoners. We're going to speak to Madsen Peary, a famous British privatisation expert for Maggie Thatcher. Monday, 5pm, precisely.